So we're going to continue looking at gifts, gifts of the Spirit. Now last week we began to look at spiritual gifts and you saw, uh, if I can remind you, that we looked at a passage where Peter talks about us being living stones. You remember that? So we are the material which God uses in, uh, in the building of his church. Uh, but we also saw that God also gives skills, right? Gives skills as well. And so we are not only the material that God uses, but he also uses us and gifts us uniquely to actually help build the church. And those are called spiritual gifts. And so we are both the material and the skilled hands that God is using to train us up and to build us up. We also learned that every single believer has been given at least one spiritual gift. You get that at new birth. It doesn't matter whether you've been, you know, you don't get spiritual gifts because you've been, you know, a good girl, all right? You don't get spiritual gifts because God likes you better than somebody else, all right? Or anything like that at all. The fact is that the moment you become born again, you become a Christian, God gives you at least one spiritual gift. And so everybody can be satisfied in the knowledge that, okay, I've got one, I've got one. You might not know what it is, but that's what part of the journey of discovery is all about, right? And that's what I'm hoping that as we go through teaching about spiritual gifts, you'll be able to start identifying what those might be, all right? And hopefully we'll be able to get you some opportunities to use your spiritual gift as well. So. That's the purpose, excuse me, behind what we're doing. So we're going to continue to dive into the spiritual gifts today. And there are three main passages in the New Testament which talk specifically about spiritual gifts. The first one is Romans 12. That's the one that we're going to be looking at today. The other one is in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 as well, and 14, all right? But that goes into more detail. So 1 Corinthians 12 is also a passage which is, deals exclusively with spiritual gifts. And then there's Ephesians 4, all right? Now, we will cover all of those, but today we're only going to look at Romans 12, which is the passage which was just read out earlier. So, because we know there are three main passages in the Scriptures which talk directly about spiritual gifts, all right? We know that spiritual gifts are important because we find them right throughout the New Testament. We see them being exercised throughout the New Testament. But it also tells us that each of these lifts, lists, I'll get my teeth stuck in properly, each of these lists, lists are not exhaustive all right? because there are certain gifts that appear in Romans that don't appear anywhere else. And likewise with all the others. Each one has certain gifts which are unique to that passage, but they also all contain gifts which appear in all of the passages, right? So there are certain which are more universal and there are other gifts which are more specific to the passages that he's talking about. But it means that no list is exhaustive. And probably if we put all three of the lists together, they're not exhaustive either. So there's actually quite a range of spiritual gifts that God gives, different abilities that he gives, different functions that he gives, and all of these work together as you begin to develop and grow in your relationship with Jesus Right, he will begin to show you exactly what they are because he's called you to glorify him by using them and to build the body of Christ by using them. So let's have a look at the Romans 12 passage and let's begin to unpack some of the guidelines around the use of spiritual gifts. Romans 12 verse 3. It says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think sober, with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. So the point that Paul is making here in verse 3 is that we need to think of ourselves soberly. Think of yourself soberly, all right? So what does it mean to think soberly of yourself? Well, we're going to have a look at that in greater detail. The idea about thinking of yourself soberly is not the process of thinking. That's not what Paul's driving at here. So he's not talking about, you know, 
you know, you're just kind of like driving along and you're thinking random thoughts and things like that, right? That's thinking, right? But this is not so much the process of thinking. The word carries the direction of thinking. So when you're thinking, it's not just thoughts, but it's a particularly directed thoughts that you're thinking. So think directingly of, how, of yourself soberly. If you remember back a couple of weeks back, at least, we actually did Romans 12, 1 and 2, which is about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember? All right? So, be transformed by the renewing of your mind is just what Paul's been talking about. And then he launches straight into this, think soberly. Having been transformed or being transformed in your mind, think soberly of yourself. So the key to understanding our purpose in Christ and the use of our spiritual gifts is linked to thinking of ourselves soberly in the direction that we're thinking. As we go from a mind which has been pressed into the mold of the world, right? Remember that the world is relentless, right? In trying to press you into its mold, into its ways of thinking, into its value system, into all those things. The world is constantly pushing you, pressing you, telling you, advertising you, Netflixing you, all those things. It's constant, right? Pressing you into its way of thinking. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't be conformed to that. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As we, as we stop being pressed into the mold of the world, which is natural thinking, we have to, how do we get out of that? How do we stop ourselves? Once we find that actually I'm a little bit bent out of shape here, right? Because I've been pressed into this mold, and now I'm walking around a little bit like this, right? How do I get unbent, right? The way you get unbent in your mind is to think in a particular direction. And that is what Paul's saying here. Think in a particular direction. Think in a certain way. That's how you get unbent from the world and get straightened out according to God's word. So sober judgment on the road to following Jesus. As we go down this journey, I want you to imagine your Christian walk is a road. And you're going down this road following Jesus. And on one side of the road is a ditch, right? And on the other side of the road is another ditch. And the ditch represents two extremes of what we find ourselves falling into. Because if we stray off the track, which is the word of God and what God says we should do and how we should live our life, we can quite easily veer towards too far into one side of the road and fall into a ditch of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. That's pride, right? We start to think of ourselves as being, well, I'm more gifted, I'm more mature, I'm more this, I'm more that than other people, right? And I have more authority or whatever. Or it might be, you know, if you have a, a, a ministry or something like that, Right? And then you start taking pride in that. Well, that's thinking of yourself more highly than you are. But what's on the other end of the road? What's on the other side of the ditch? Thinking too low, thinking too low of yourself, exactly. <laughs> so if you're on the opposite side and you think to yourself, oh, poor old me, right? I'm just a worm, I'm no good, I'm worthless, I don't have anything to offer anybody, that's thinking too low of yourself. And both thinking too low and thinking too highly of yourself is not biblical. Because we want to be where? Yeah. Right in the middle. <laughs> right in the middle because that's what the Word of God tells us about ourselves. And because there's a lot in the Word that speaks about our identity in Christ. Isn't that right? You could nod. Yeah, it does. Right? There's lots in the Word which talks about our identity in Christ. And if we stay on the road thinking in a particular direction, which is what Jesus says about me, then you won't go far off. You won't stray into the woe is me, I'm worthless, and I'm no good to anyone, because I've blown it, or I've failed, or I've been told I'm a failure. 
You won't believe those things. You'll believe what the Word of God says about you. And likewise, you won't start thinking that you're the bee's knees, right? Or the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? Because that is wrongful thinking too. So that's what happens when we, uh, to be thinking in a particular direction. You want to be thinking new creation. Who am I in Jesus as a new creation in Christ? That's where you want to be. That's the sweet spot, all right? You get yourself in the middle of that road and just keep on trucking. You'll get where you're going, guaranteed. All right. So when Paul talks about this, I'm sure that he has in mind Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Remember, this is a letter to the Roman church. All right. Now, in Rome, there were, well, in fact, everywhere that Paul went, he always went to the synagogue first and preached to the believers, preached to the synagogue Jews and preached Christ to them. And then what you found is that churches would grow up in the synagogue believers and then as time went on Gentiles, those who weren't Jewish and weren't believers in, in Judaism, right, came to faith in Christ. So we ended up with this Jewish slash Gentile church and there was all sorts of fights that were going on because the Jews believed that, well, because we've got the law and we've got the history, and we've got all the background, we've got Moses, and we've got all the prophets, and we've got the Torah, we're better than the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are thinking, yeah, but you're just a bunch of ignorant people, unsophisticated, because you're not Roman. Because Romans are the most sophisticated people, aren't they? Culturally more sophisticated, sophisticated than everything else. I mean, just look at the way that we tax everybody, right? That's, that's really sophisticated, right? So, so both the Gentiles and the Jews were always at loggerheads thinking that they were better than each other. And I'm sure as Paul writes this, think of yourself soberly. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. He's got these two factions in mind. Because he says that in Christ Jesus, the two, Jew and Gentile, are made one, aren't they? So there is no Jew and Gentile in Christ. There is no us and them in Christ. It's only the in Christ. And that's a perfect example of what it means to think in a particular direction. Because when we take a hold of the truth of what the scripture says about us and our identity, and we begin to appropriate that, and we begin to say, this is who I am, and this is who you are, we begin to think of ourselves and other people soberly in the light of the scriptures. So it's a perfect example of what Paul's saying. Think in a particular direction. Paul has been consistent throughout the letter to the Romans that faith has been given to every believer and has resulted in new birth. So there's a faith that we all share in common. It's been given to you, it's been given to the Jews, it's been given to the Gentiles. Anyone who comes to faith in Christ has been given a measure of faith. And that measure of faith has brought you to full salvation in Jesus. And so he talks about this measure of faith. Uh, what does he say? Um, Think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. You all have a measure of faith. You've all got it. If you've accepted Christ, you've got that measure of faith. Now, Paul's uh, writing here, as we've said, has been consistent that that measure of faith has been given to every believer, consistent in his letter. Now, if we read that the faith that he's talking about here is in terms of my faith is bigger than your faith, right? Then I've got more faith than you've got. Therefore, I see more things happening. Or I've got more faith than you've got, therefore miracles happen. Or you mustn't have faith, or you mustn't have enough faith because we don't see answers to prayer, right? This is the this is what the trap that Paul's trying to get us to avoid. Because as soon as we start to think of faith in terms of quantity, I've got more than you've got, pride creeps in, doesn't it? Spiritual pride. And we start comparing ourselves one with another. And that's not what Paul's saying. 
Paul saying each of you have been given the measure of the faith. So you all have the same measure of faith. It's not about quantity, it's not about size at all. It's about faith. Therefore, the faith is the gospel that we believe. And it's the measure by which we think soberly and objectively about ourselves and who we are in Jesus, who we are in Christ. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 says, from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view, according to worldly standards and values, though we have known Christ from a human point of view, now we know him no longer in this way. So Paul, right, in Corinthians here, is saying, we don't regard people according to the world's standards anymore. We don't think of people in terms of status. We don't think of people in terms of, well, men are better than women. We don't think about people in terms of whether they are slave or free, or whether they're a manager, or whether they're a blue collar worker, or a white collar worker, or anything else like that at all. Those are all human things. Those are all ways that we used to think. We don't think like that anymore. We used to think, Paul says, of Jesus in worldly terms, but we don't think about him like that anymore. And so he's saying here again, this is we don't think like that anymore, we think according to the new creation. We see one another, we see ourselves and we see others, who they are in Jesus. That's how we're to regard one another. No other way. That's sober thinking. To think with sober judgment then is to be aware of the pitfalls on either side of the road and to avoid them and staying in the boundaries of scripture. And as you do, you will more easily begin to discern when others are in the ditch and you're able to help them out. Because that's what we're there to do. We're to build one another up, aren't we? Right, so what do you do when somebody's falling in a ditch? That's your fault, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> you know, you shouldn't have, been, shouldn't have been playing on the edge of the ditch and you wouldn't have found yourself in there. Well, that might be true, but we don't leave them there, do we? We help them out, right? And we make sure that they don't put us into the ditch while we're trying to help them, right? Because we need to be thinking ourselves soberly, with sober judgment, in accordance with the Word of God. I hope I've laboured that one long enough. Yes? I can continue. <laughs> All right. All right. So the gifts are Christ-shaped. They're shaped according to Christ because he is the standard. He's the one who gives the gifts, and we're trying to become like him, aren't we? So the gifts of God are Christ-shaped. Let's read on to the next passage in uh, verses 4 and 5. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though we are many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Second point that I want to pull out here is that we belong to each other. We belong to one another. I know the world tries to get you to squeeze into its mold of thinking that we're all individuals, right? That we all just stand on our own two feet, our own merits, and we've got to be the be all and the end all, right, to get anywhere in life, and it's all about me, right? That's really unbiblical. Right? Paul says, no, we aren't all individuals. We all belong to one another because we're all part of one body. So Paul, before he dives into the gifts, gives us a key to understanding the purpose and the operational parameters of the gifts. The body of Christ, he says, operates in exactly the same way that your body operates. How many bodies do you have? One. All right. That's the right answer. <laughs> All right. That's the correct answer. All right. You might have multiple personalities, but you've only got one body. All right. So, so when we've only got one body and that one body is all that you have, right? What happens when parts of your body don't function correctly? What happens if one of your systems in your body stops working properly? It affects the rest of the body. It affects the whole body entirely. 
if your immune system starts to go down, all right, the rest of your body's gonna get sick real quick, yes? If your nervous system starts to shut down, the rest of your body is gonna suffer. If you lose an arm, then you've lost part of who you are and how you function. And you've got to start, that's going to affect everything, isn't it? And, Jesus, and Paul says, the body of Christ is absolutely no different. Why we think about it differently, I don't know. There is one body, one body in Jesus, not many bodies. I know we talked about denominations earlier, right? But those are just parts of the body, not the full body, all right? Parts of the body, but there's only one body. And when one part of the body is not functioning... The rest of the body suffers. We belong to one another. Therefore, think soberly, not individualistically, as our culture keeps promoting. Do the members of our own body have the same function? No, of course not. I can't scratch my belly button with my big toe. It has a completely different function, all right? There are lots of things that I can do with many parts of my body, but there are things that my body does which are just simply unique to that part. And so my body does not have the same function, same thing in the body of Christ, right? Which is why pastors can't do it all, because we're not made to do it all. Nobody's made to do it all. We all rely on one another. We all belong to one another, and each one of us has a different function within the body of Christ. So Jesus has assigned to each one of us a function within the body of Christ. Yes? If we know that each of us has a spiritual gift, which we do, we've already settled that one, then each of us has a function. So we all have a function to play in the body of Christ. And like a human person, your function, your capabilities, your gifts, the things that you do in the body of Christ change and grow as like a person. You know, when you have a baby, a baby can't do very much. I mean, it still has a function. Usually the parents find that one out because they're the ones that clean it all up, all right? But, you know, babies have function, right? But they can't do an awful lot for other people. But as they grow up, their capacities and their capabilities grow up with them and as they mature they're able to express those better and so by the time you reach adulthood you've got a pretty good idea as who you are what you're about and what your capabilities are it's the same thing in jesus that doesn't mean just because you're a brand new christian that you've got no function you have a function you absolutely have a function We'll look more about functions when we get into Ephesians 4 and the fivefold ministries of the church, but I want us to focus a little bit more on the gifts. For now, it's just enough for us to understand that each one of us belongs to one another and for the local expression of the body of Christ to function means that we'll get healthy. So as we function, as we find out what our gifts are and as we begin to use them, we as a body, we as a local church, we'll begin to get healthier and healthier and healthier, and we will continue to mature in Jesus. And our gifts will grow with that. That's what we need to know right now. We will be using our spiritual gifts to serve the body. Let's have a look at Romans 12 and verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. So the third point that Paul makes here is to use your gifts to build the body of Christ. That's the purpose of the gifts. So again, this is one of the parameters, one of the guidelines that surround the gifts. They're there to build up the body of Jesus, all right? So you may have a brilliant gift, all right, that is self-serving, it just builds you up, which is great, but if it's not building up the body of Jesus, it means it's either not a spiritual gift or you're misusing your gift. You're not using it properly. All right? So one of those things, one of those things we need to remember is we think about our own spiritual gifts. They're there to build the body of Jesus Christ. None of us 
have all the gifts. Not a single person has all the gifts. All right, God very deliberately and very intentionally leaves us with gaps. Why? Why do you think God might leave us with gaps in our abilities and capabilities? Pardon me? Keep us humble. Keep us humble. 100%, yes. And keeps us reliant, right? Keeps us reliant on others. And so every single one of us has strengths, we have weaknesses, and we have limitations. So what we want to do is we want to find out what those strengths are, what those gifts are which God has given us, and we want to use them. We want to work with our strengths. Where we have weaknesses, we want to be working at those weaknesses so they're not weak anymore. Right? So we raise them into that place where they become functional. Right? And they're not weaknesses anymore. But every single one of us also has limitations. And what do we do with limitations? We accept them. Because that's just an area that you don't have. Simple as that. But somebody else does. And that's why we belong to one another. So we work on our strengths. We improve our weaknesses. And we accept our limitations. That is what makes unity in diversity and the church becomes strong because we need one another. If every single one of us had all the gifts, then I wouldn't need you, would I? I wouldn't need you at all. I'd just get on and do it all myself. And so would you. But we don't. We have limitations. And so that's part of belonging one to one another. Each body part has a different function. We don't all have the same function. So the gifts serve to fill the gaps in us. Those things that we don't have, other people do. And it builds unity and maturity in the body of Christ. So we don't use the gifts to build up ourselves. We don't use them for self-aggrandizement. We don't do it so that we can puff ourselves up and have everybody see how wonderful and clever we are. Right? That's not the proper use of the gifts. Rather, we use them in humility to build the body of Christ and to glorify God. Now, when you think about Paul's letter, Paul writes this letter to the Romans. He'd never been to Rome. Right? Not like the letter to the Corinthians, right? He spent a lot of time in Corinth. And so he knows the church in Corinth and he writes letters about what's going on in Corinth and we'll read some of that next time, probably. But Rome, he's never been to Rome before. He doesn't know the church personally. He didn't plant the church. And yet he talks about these gifts as though he knows they're already present in the body. And so we can see by the Romans that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are supposed to be normative. They're not supposed to be, you know, something that's kind of like out there, Paul assumes to a church he's never planted, never been to, that you've got gifts and they're already in operation within you. So there's something that he understood about the body of Christ, that we all have gifts and there's an expectation that we're going to be using them. One of these he talks about here at the beginning is prophecy. Now, prophecy, what is it? What is prophecy? Well, if we're going to find out what prophecy is, we need to read the scripture because we want that to tell us what it means. We don't want to kind of just make it up as we go along, right? So we want to see what it says. And so those scriptures actually do say that prophecy includes foretelling. And you'll read about this in Acts 11. Uh, Acts 11 and Acts 21, there was a prophet called Agabus, right, in the New Testament. And there were also, remember Philip the Evangelist? Right, goes down and meets the Ethiopian, right, as he goes back towards Ethiopia and the guy gets saved. Philip, the evangelist. Philip had four daughters, and each one of his daughters were prophetesses. They were recognized as being prophets. So we've already got five people attested to as prophets in the New Testament. And these were people that gave words and told Paul and others about things that were happening. That is an expression of the mature gift of a recognized prophet. We don't all go around telling everybody's future, right? That's not what it's about, right? That's if you're a recognized prophet. That is part of the ability. 
Most broadly, it's about information being given to the prophet by the Holy Spirit to edify the church. Right? We'll be reading more about that in detail when we come to Corinthians. Prophecy, certainly in the New Testament, does not have the same authority that the teaching of the apostles did. Right? Because as somebody gave a prophetic word, other prophets and the other people in the church were supposed to listen to the word and then weigh it according to scripture. So scripture itself carries a higher authority than a prophetic word. So it should be and rightly gets weighed. It isn't something we just accept out there. Now it says here, Paul says, according to the measure of faith. So if you prophesy, prophesy in accordance with the measure of your faith. Well, again, what does that mean? According to the size of your faith? You've got a big faith, you've got a small faith? Well, that's a bit of a contradiction again, isn't it? Because we've just talked about how Paul's been consistent in his use of faith. So there are two schools of thought here. The first is that the measure of faith is what you can believe for, right? So if you can believe for something big, then you can prophesy something big. If your faith is only for something small, make sure you only prophesy something small, right? That's one opinion. Problem is, that's very subjective. How do you know whether somebody's got a big faith or not? Well, you don't. We don't all go around with badges saying, hey, my faith's this big, how big's yours? <laughs> we just don't do that, you can't measure that, right? So that's a, a wrongful kind of measure and it leads to one or the other ditch on the side of the road, right? So the second opinion is that this is the measure of faith, which is the yardstick of the gospel. So common faith that is passed down to us, that the apostles taught us, that is the faith, the gospel, the faith. And so when we prophesy, we prophesy in accordance with the faith. So when you give a word from God, it has to align with the word of God. It has to be in alignment with what the Bible says. Otherwise, it's false. And so when we prophesy, we prophesy in accordance with the faith. That is the way that we hold prophecy. That's the way that we do it in the church here. But we don't deviate from that. So we don't go prophesying about things that aren't in the Bible to people, right? We don't go telling people that uh, we've seen your future and it, you know, it looks bright or whatever or dark. I've heard those too. Right? We don't do that, right? Because that's not biblical, right? So we don't want to, uh, we want to be making sure that when we give a word to somebody that uh, if it's in alignment with the word of God, if it's in alignment with what Jesus says about you and what he says about others, then it's objective and it provides safe boundaries for prophetic speech. All right. So that's the position that we take and we'll continue to take. So we don't speak beyond the boundaries of what the New Testament teaches and we certainly won't accept any Old Testament prophets, right? So there's no calling down fire, right, upon anyone, right, when you prophesy, right? Thus saith the Lord, you've been a bad boy, therefore the fire of God's coming down upon you, right? That's Old Testament prophecy is not welcome here. It's not what we do. Let's have a look at some of these other ones that Paul talks about uh, in verse seven and eight. He says, if serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's in to encourage, then give encouragement. Serving, the word there literally means a servant or a minister, right? So you've heard of deacons, right? Deacons in the, in the New Testament, right? That were servers on tables. They went and served the old ladies, right? And the widows, that's what it means, it's a servant, right? Problem is when we start talking about ministers and things like that is it's a really loaded term, right? Because we think about ministers as people who either wear dog collars or you're a pastor or something. That's not what this word means. So we use the word servant and serving, right? So this is a definition from Peter Wagner about this. Uh, serving is the special ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to identify the unmet needs involved in a task relating to God's work and to make use of available resources to meet those needs and to help accomplish the desired goals. 
So that is somebody who has a gift of serving. You just see the need. And then you go around looking, how do I feel the need? That's kind of the sort of thing that's operating in your heart, right? Or you may come up to one of the leadership teams and say, hey, you know, this is happening or so-and-so in the, in the body of Christ isn't being looked after, what can we do to help, right? You see the need because that's what's in your heart. That's your gift, all right? This is one of those gifts which God puts on many people, right? It's, it's one of those gifts which lots of people have, the gift of serving. Uh, the gift, you'll see a lot of these in the church. Uh, one of those things might be youth ministry that's going on downstairs, right? We've got two people in our congregation. They're not youth pastors, but there's a need. And so they go down and they've been filling it, and they're doing that now. That's a gift of serving, right? So that's what's happening. It may be worship ministry. It may be setting up a church. This is a, a, a gift which is a general, a generalized gifting, all right? So many, many people have this gift in the church. When I first came into the church when I was a wee nipper, all right, I used to go to church and nobody asked me, I just put the chairs out because that's what you do, right? I just stacked chairs at the end of the service and, and I ended up going greeting on the door and anything that was going, I just stuck my hand up and I just said, yeah, I'll do it because I've got a gift of serving and I see that there's need and I just go and do it. And it was a joy to do that. That's part of what happens in the body of Christ when you've got people with gifts of serving, right? Stan and Natasha do this, they don't get paid for it. They probably would like to get paid for it, but they don't get paid for it, right? But they're here before anyone arrives and they go home after everyone leaves and they lock up and they make sure that this whole place is set up so that you can come and you can enjoy your service. That's a gift of service. How do I know they've got a gift of serving? Because they tell me every week, I just love doing this. I can't help but do this. This is the highlight of my week is coming and serving you. That's what they're like. Because they've got a gift of serving. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. So we honour them. Honour them for what they do. The gift of teaching. The definition of a gift of teaching is a special ability to communicate information relevant to the health and the ministry of the body in such a way that others will learn. Gifts, uh, they, these, this gift of teaching all right, is not only just a gift to teach, it's also an office. All right? So you may be a teacher right in the church and it is also a function the church functions as a teaching body so in fact this is a very all-encompassing gift which is in the church so uh, it's not the same as preaching teaching is not the same as preaching what's the difference between teaching and preaching Ooh, I don't know. when you preach right you're sharing a message with the view for somebody making a decision when you teach, you teach so that people learn. You know they've learned because they remember what you taught. <laughs> and they put it into practice. <laughs> I'm somewhere, I'm sure there's a gift of listening too. But anyway, um, it's, so that's the gift of teacher, all right? Now, uh, it's, uh, so I have to think of myself with sober thought, right? Because I'm a teacher. Right? That actually is my gift, right? I have a gift of teaching. But I think of myself with sober thought in accordance with the gift that's been given to me. So I know that my teaching is restricted to the local body. I don't think of myself as being Timothy Keller, right? God bless him, all right? I'm not Timothy Keller. I'm not some international teacher that has an international ministry. And I don't go around spending my time writing books right so that other people outside there might be able to pick them up my teaching gift is for you it's for the church the local church and occasionally i get asked to teach at other places i've taught at bible college right i'm that's my gift right but i know where it is my my gift is here in the local body so i don't think of myself and puff myself up thinking that i'm something that i'm not right that's what sober thinking is 
Encouragement or exhortation is a gift of speaking words of encouragement and comfort or counsel to other members of the body in such a way that they feel helped and healed. This is a gift that we often find in fledgling pastors and disciple makers because to exhort others to live into their identity in Christ. So there's part of that which is to come alongside others and to encourage them to live rightly according to what God has called them to. A famous person in the scripture who was called the son of encouragement. What was his name? Barnabas. Remember Barnabas? Barnabas, right? He was the guy that picked up Paul when he was young, the apostle Paul, right? And also John Mark. And they took him on mission trips around the place. And so Barnabas was called the son of encouragement because he operated in his gift. What would have happened if Barnabas hadn't exercised his gift of encouragement and developed it? <coughs> we wouldn't have half the New Testament, which was written by Paul, and we wouldn't have the Gospel of Mark, which was written by Mark. So half of our New Testament wouldn't be there if it wasn't for that gift of encouragement. So this is a significant gift and one that you can grow with and develop. With all the gifts you can do that. So we can see that all these gifts are vocal gifts, prophetic encouragement, teaching or preaching. So why, that's why here in the church, we give opportunities. That's why I ask people to come and do MC. That's why I ask people to do communion. So I ask people to come and preach. Why? Not because I want a day off, all right? No, it's true. <laughs> it isn't because I want a day off. It's because I want to see whether you've got one of those gifts, one of those gifts of teaching or encouragement or exhortation, because it's through those opportunities that you get to discover whether you have a particular gift. And we get to see that. And as we get to sit under your ministry when you're sharing, if we feel encouraged, I get people come up to me after and say, hey, they did a really awesome job. When are they going to speak again? So that's the reason why. It's not so that I can have time off. It's so that we can see the gifts growing in you and help you develop. That is why we give opportunity for people to have a go. I'll speed up. Let's look at the last part here in Romans 12, verse eight. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Giving. The definition of giving is a special ability that is given to people to contribute their material resources to the work of the Lord with liberality and cheerfulness. We are all called to give materially to the work of the ministry of the local church, every single one of us. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a gift of giving just because you give. We're talking about something which goes above and beyond the normal giving into the ministry. And there are people who do that, all right? They give more than that. There's a special grace that God puts on the heart of individuals to give way more than what some people call a tithe or 10%. And they give much more than that. One such person who operates in a particular gift of giving says that it's not about how much I give. It's about how much I keep. Because they give, this particular person gives 90% of their income. They keep 10 for themselves. That's a gift of giving in operation. That's a special gift that God has given them. So one thing is common to all, and as I've spoken to people with a gift of giving, they will all testify that giving is one of the most rewarding things that they do, and they get immense joy from doing it. They are some of the most happiest people that I know because they just love to give. Leader. What's the definition of leader? Well, this is a really big subject and one that we don't have time to go into. We will do, but just not today. So the gift of leader, the basic definition, holds true in every circumstance. It's a special ability to set goals in accordance with God's purposes 
for the future and to communicate these goals to others in such a way that they voluntarily and harmoniously work together to accomplish those goals for the glory of God. So it's about somebody who's able to set goals and to get people to work harmoniously towards those goals, right? How do you know whether you're a good leader or not? When a volunteer organization, next time you have a project and you're asking people, you've got people saying, I'll work on your team. That's how you know you're a good leader. How do you know you're a bad leader? Because having accomplished something and reached all of your targets and done an excellent job by your results, you ask somebody next time, who wants to help me in the next project? Everyone goes, oh, I'm busy that day. Oh, I can't be part of that because I don't like being on your team. That means you might be able to get things done, but you're not a very good leader, all right? But anyway, we won't go into that any more than that. That's what being a good leader is, and some people are called to be good leaders. They just are. And just because you hold a position in church doesn't necessarily mean you have the gift of leadership. And then there is the final one, the gift of mercy. Again, this is another one of these gifts which a high percentage of people in the body of Christ will have. It is the ability to feel genuine empathy and compassion for individuals, both Christian and non-Christian, who suffer distressing physical, mental, or emotional problems, and to translate that compassion into cheerfully done deeds that reflect Christ's love and alleviate suffering. This gift focuses on the deeds of love and compassion. We need these gifts in greater visibility in our community. It's been the suppression of this gift in evangelical circles that has placed us, puts us in a position in our society where people see us in suspicion because we've been quick to tell people, right, that, uh, that you know, they need to get saved but ignoring the fact that they actually have some needs. And so we actually need to raise the profile of this particular gift of mercy so that people will feel the love of Christ before they believe in Christ. That opens the door to sharing the good news. Right? We don't lead always with the gospel, but we should always lead with compassion and we should always lead with love because that opens the door to people's hearts. So the gospel should first be felt before it is heard. You guys have been very patient with me and I am going to finish it up right now, all right, after a few more words. So keep the tape rolling for another half an hour and we'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> spiritual gifts, what are they? The spiritual gifts are, first of all, Christ-shaped. They are Christ-shaped. The use of the gifts is governed by our thinking and our acting consistently towards our new identity in Christ. The spiritual gifts are for the body. They are specifically designed for health and maturing of the body of Christ. The spiritual gifts are uniquely given. Every single person has a unique gift mix. Just because Heidi might have a gift of mercy and I might have a gift of mercy, doesn't mean that we operate it in the same way. Doesn't mean that we do things identically because we are completely unique. Because your gifts also mix with your calling and your personality and your character. And all those things end up as a unique blend of you and how the Spirit of God moves through you. So you may have the same gift as somebody else, but that way that it gets used to build the body of Christ is entirely unique to you, which is why we need your gift in operation in the church, because nobody does it quite the way you do. It sounds a bit like a song, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> nobody does it better than you, all right? <laughs> Let's wrap it up now. <laughs> the spiritual gifts are to be used to the best of our ability. We recognize that the use of our gifts is not optional, but essential. They're designed for the building of the church under the direction of the Holy Spirit. They are our worship. 
They're part of that acceptable service that Peter speaks about. So, therefore, if it's our offering to God, if it's our worship to God, we want to be giving the best, don't we? So we need to be making sure that not only do we know what our gifts are, but we give God the very, very best that we have so that he gets the glory and the church gets the honor. All right, I've taken up enough of your time.